Hello and welcome to a new episode of Bite Sized Book History. I'm your host, Ali Alvis, who some of you may know better as Book Historia across various social media platforms. I'm a book historian and rare book cataloger at antiquarian book dealer Type Punch Matrix. If I asked you to imagine a beautiful book, I bet you would think of something like this. This is an illuminated manuscript. If you've watched my video on manicules, you'll already be halfway to figuring out the word origin of manuscript. We have the familiar manu for hand and scriptus meaning written. But where does illuminated come from? One common definition is that for an illustration to be illuminated, it must make use of gold or silver leaf. These metals would glint in the candlelight and make the manuscript sparkle. But my preferred definition comes from historian Michelle P. Brown, who calls for illuminations simply to use luminous colors. This is a broader definition that encompasses things like the Lindisfarne Gospels, which I would be loath to not call an illuminated manuscript. Western illuminated manuscripts had their heyday in the Middle Ages, which for the purposes of this video, last from around the 5th century to circa 1450. Before the development of print in the West, your options for communication were either oral or manuscript. So manuscripts were the only way to disseminate information, apart from just telling it to someone. But not all manuscripts were illuminated. Things like everyday lists, contracts, diaries, legal documents, and such were generally unadorned. But many genres of medieval manuscript could be illuminated. Examples exist of exquisitely embellished books of classical literature, hunting guides, medical and scientific works, and courtly romances. One genre I particularly like are bestiaries. Bestiaries are kind of proto-natural history descriptive works about various animals, and their illuminations can range from beautiful to somewhat questionable. The most widely produced manuscripts in medieval Europe were those of a religious nature, and I don't just mean Bibles. Huge choir books, liturgical works, and books of hours in particular survive in large numbers. And those are books of hours as in the time, not mine and yours, unfortunately. Books of hours are personal prayer books containing prayers to be said at different hours of the day. If a medieval family owned one manuscript, it would be a book of hours. Books of hours are known for their beautiful illustrations, often called miniatures. And while some of these illustrations could be small and exquisitely detailed, miniature does not refer to the size. Instead, it comes from the Latin miniare, to color with red lead. So what are we looking at when we see an illuminated page? Let's walk through page layout and take a look at the order in which these parts were completed. First came the text, written by a scribe. In the early Middle Ages, the scribe and illuminator were often the same person. But by the late Middle Ages, the two vocations had largely been divided. The scribe left blank spaces in the text for the addition of ornamental initials and miniatures. Next came the rubrication. This comes from the Latin rubricare, to color red. And this task could be done by the scribe or by a trained rubricator. Rubrication was used to set off smaller divisions within the text, such as paragraphs. Line breaks wouldn't be invented until the early modern period, so the red helped the reader find their way amidst a wall of text. Although rubrication can be quite detailed and fancy, it's still a step down from illumination. The illuminator would be the last person to work on the page. They would fill in miniatures or large initials in the blank spaces left by the scribe. Sometimes, if the artist were a particularly well-known master, they would craft their illuminations totally separately from the rest of the book. These loose illuminations would then be bound into the text. Illuminators were known to have some fun when it came to the margins beyond the miniatures and text. And I'll do a deep dive into this in my next episode. As I've been showing you these stunning medieval works of art, you've all probably been wondering, how did they stay so bright? It certainly helps that they're nestled between the pages of a book and are protected from light unless the book itself is open. But a lot of their bright color owes to the pigments used by the illuminators. 
I already mentioned Minium, Red Lead, but that was only one pigment on the Technicolor palette of the medieval artist. Lead could also be used to make white, yellow, and even a light violet, depending on how it was heated and prepared. Terra Vert is described by Amy Baker as one of the workhorses of the palette. It was made from a combination of the minerals glauconite and celadonite. Browns such as umber and sienna, both containing iron oxide and manganese oxide, were used relatively sparingly, as brighter colors were much more exciting to look at. And of course, there are the blues. Ultramarine, made of lapis lazuli, was the most expensive pigment and was used only for important figures. The robes of the Virgin Mary, for example, were often ultramarine. Azurite was a less expensive alternative and was used much more widely. Unfortunately, it can sometimes acquire a greenish tinge thanks to its copper content. Instructions on how to make these colors were described in recipe books, such as the 15th century Göttingen model book. If you can't get enough of the stories of medieval pigments, I recommend this book. Spike Bucklow's The Alchemy of Paint. It contains stories weird and wonderful of the origins of medieval pigments. Some true, and some a bit more fantastic. That does it for this episode of Bite Sized Book History. If you enjoyed it, make sure to click those manicules on the like and subscribe buttons. And feel free to drop a comment below if you have any book history topics you would like to hear me speak about in future episodes. I'll see you next time, and remember, don't bite your books. Mm -hmm.